Prepare to have your world rocked. Deep in the dusty expanse of New Mexico, the infamous Roswell incident has tantalized imaginations for decades. But now, startling new revelations are emerging, casting an entirely different light on the events of that fateful day in 1947. Brace yourself for a truth so shocking, it could rewrite the history of humanity's encounter with the cosmos. Well, today we are talking about one of the biggest UFO conspiracies in history, the one that really stemmed it all, Roswell. Get right into it. As James said, the Roswell incident is arguably the most famous UFO crash in history, although the government would claim otherwise. Basically, on June 24th of 1947, while searching for a crashed military aircraft, pilot Kenneth Arnold spotted nine UFOs flying over the Cascade Mountains of Washington State in the U.S. The objects were flying in formation at a height of about 10,000 feet and a speed of approximately 1,900 kilometers per hour, which was not possible at the time, for humans that is. Kenneth described the way the objects moved as jerky, like rocks skipping over the water, flashing forward at strange intervals. When the media got a hold of the story, they coined the phrase flying saucer and the UFO craze took off at hyperspeed. Especially when on July 7th, a local rancher named Mac Brazel called the sheriff to let him know that one of those objects had somehow ended up on his farm. And this came to be known as the Roswell Incident. It was back in July of 1947 that something strange happened near Roswell, New Mexico. Something had crashed into the ground, into Brazel's farm. There were metal pieces, rubber strips, and a strange tin foil-like material. The nearby Roswell Army Airfield was alerted. The military came out and collected the debris. At first, they issued a press release saying, Saying they had recovered an unknown flying disc. This really got people talking, but just a day later, the army changed their story, saying it was actually just a weather balloon. Now, while some of the public took this at face value, it caused some controversy, especially in the years to come. People started to believe that the military was covering up something much, much bigger, possibly an alien spacecraft crash. Over the years, people started to come forward claiming to have seen the wreckage, and not only were there strange markings on the material, described by some as hieroglyphics, but the material was incredibly strong and seemed to almost be impossible to burn. Oh, and of course, people who'd been called to the site to recover the material claimed to have seen bodies, bodies that were clearly not human. Over the years, many people have questioned the official explanation for this incident. Even former military personnel and locals said they saw strange things at the crash site, like debris that didn't look like it came from any known aircraft, and even small bodies that didn't seem human. In 1994, the US Air Force released a report saying the debris was from a top secret project called Project Mogul, a project that used high altitude balloons to detect Soviet nuclear tests. They said the unusual materials found were just parts of these balloons and their sensors, but this explanation didn't satisfy everyone. In 1997, on the 50th anniversary of the incident, the Air Force released another report to address the claims about these alien bodies. They said these were actually just crash test dummies used in military experiments, not extraterrestrial beings. But again, a lot of people were and still are highly skeptical of this. The Roswell incident happened less than two years after the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan in 1945. Those bombs were created through a secret project that lasted three years and had three main sites, including one in New Mexico. So if the government could keep the atomic bomb a secret for so long, why wouldn't they be able and willing to hide? information about a crashed UFO landing. Plus, little mannequins? I think most people would look at that and, and be able to tell the difference between an alien and a crash test dummy. So this foreign object that landed on Mac Brazel's farm actually did so a few days prior to him calling into the sheriff's department. To be honest, he hadn't thought much of it until he started reading about Kenneth Arnold flying saucers and UFOs in the papers. Once he learned about the possible presence of technologically advanced ships with no known origin that likely came from outer space, he 
began to wonder if that was in fact what had landed on his farm just a few nights ago. And so he gathered up some of the debris and took them down to the local police station. In response, the sheriff immediately contacted the nearby army base and soon intelligence officer Jesse Marcel had arrived on the scene and instructed Brazel to take him to the crash site so that the two could collect more debris. So let's talk about Jesse Marcel, the first military officer to step foot on the scene of the crash because apparently Jesse had a lot to say according to his son Jesse Jr who went on to tell his father's story after his death in 1986. According to Jesse Jr in 1947 when he was just 10 years old his father woke him up in the middle of the night excited after having visited the crash site. Jesse Jr sat up as Jesse Sr handed him some of the debris he had collected earlier that day on Brazel's farm and he told Jesse Jr to get a good look because the debris were something that he would never see again. They were not of this earth and the pair simply could not make sense of them. Out of all of the debris his father had brought home, Jesse Jr said that the one that fascinated him most was a small beam with purple hued hieroglyphics. I suppose it's not difficult to see why the pair didn't believe the government when they released a report saying that what had been found on the Brazels farm was nothing more than a discarded weather balloon. But of course you don't mess with the government. And so for years, both Jesse Jr and his father kept quiet about what they had seen. That is until in the late 1970s, a man named Stanton Friedman showed up asking questions. Stanton T. Friedman, a nuclear physicist turned ufologist, tracked down Jesse Sr. after being tipped off that a retired military man might know something about the Roswell incident, something that had been kept from the public for the past 31 years. And it turns out he did. Jesse Sr. told Friedman that the weather balloon story had in fact been a cover up and that the original wreckage had been replaced with a weather balloon shortly after military personnel first arrived on the scene. Not only that, but Jesse claimed that despite what their superiors had wanted them to believe, it was incredibly clear to everyone working on the site that the object had in fact been an extraterrestrial spaceship with outstanding craftsmanship and incredibly advanced out of this world technologies. Although unfortunately Jesse did claim that he never got to witness the alleged aliens inside of the craft being pulled out, but still he's ex-military, he was there, it's a pretty compelling case if you ask me. The Majestic 12 are allegedly a group of 12 world renowned scientists, generals and politicians hired to investigate the Roswell incident involving an alien spacecraft that supposedly crash landed in Mexico in 1947. After investigating the crash site, the 12 individuals involved, also known as MJ-12 for short, concluded that the incident had in fact been an extraterrestrial crash landing. Furthermore, when the spacecraft collided with Earth, it was carrying three or four extraterrestrials, all of which died on impact. After the investigation, M-12 suggested that a military installation be erected to contain and study the deceased aliens, their ship, and the technologies aboard the ship. The installation would later come to be known as Area 51 which up until that time was solely used as a weapons testing facility, generally for nuclear weaponry. Speaking of the Roswell incident, let's go into more detail on it. So this incident is said to be responsible for pretty much every modern UFO and alien related conspiracy today. It all started in July of 1947 when something crashed on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. At first the military issued press releases saying they had recovered a flying disc. But the very next day they changed their story claiming it was just a weather balloon. Suddenly there was tons of suspicion and rightfully so. Witnesses including a rancher named Mac Brazel who found the debris described strange materials that didn't look or behave like anything they had ever seen. Some accounts even mentioned mysterious bodies being recovered from the crash site. Over the years a number of theories have come about. Some say the debris and bodies were actually from a top secret military experiment called Project Mogul, which involved high altitude balloons designed to detect Soviet nuclear tests. But UFO enthusiasts argue this was just a cover story. The idea that the Roswell crash was an alien spacecraft really took off in the 70s when researchers and former military personnel came forward with new claims telling stories of alien bodies, secret autopsies, and a massive government cover-up. And at the heart of this cover-up, 
Majestic 12, who were supposedly tasked with handling the incident and keeping it under wraps. MJ-12, once known as a top secret society, came to be known by the public after a letter sent out by former President Truman in 1974 authorizing the CIA to create the organization was supposedly leaked online, along with other documents supporting the existence of the organization. The documents date all the way back to 1978, a year after the group was supposedly formed. While the government and M-12 non-believers claim that both the letter the document circulating online and the group as a whole is a complete fabrication. There are two legitimate and classified documents that we know of that exist to support the claims of the group. The first is the official US government policy and result of Project Aquarius, which is classified as quote, top secret with no decimation outside channels and with access restricted to MJ-12, end quote. The other supporting document is currently located in the National archives in Washington, D.C. That document is headed Memorandum for General Twining from Robert Cutler, Special Assistant to the President, Subject National Security Council MJ-12 Special Studies Project. Yeah, so you're telling me that there are two known classified government documents that literally have MJ-12 mentioned in the header, but we're supposed to believe that the whole thing is just a big crock of nothing? No, there is clearly something going on here. Mind control is also a big part of the conspiracy conspiracy theories surrounding Majestic 12. Have they been working with or using advanced alien technology to influence or even control people's thoughts? Well, according to some conspiracy theorists, yes. One of the most well-known stories is that MJ-12 conducted experiments using techniques like hypnosis, illicit substances, and electromagnetic fields. These methods were supposedly used to erase memories or implant false ones, making people believe in things that never happened or forget things that did. You know, men in black type stuff. This has led to the theory that some UFO sightings or alien abduction stories could be the result of these mind control experiments. Another angle is that MJ-12 allegedly developed technologies for mass mind control. This could mean using broadcasts, waves or signals that affect large groups of people subtly influencing their thoughts and actions without them even knowing it, of course. Some theories go as far as to suggest that this mind-altering technology has been tested in public without anyone realizing it. Now, if you think a government institution carrying out mind control experiments sounds far-fetched, I mean, it does, but it's not unheard of. We've talked about MKUltra on the channel before, a real CIA program that investigated mind control. MKUltra did some pretty shady stuff. It'd give test subjects psychedelics without their knowledge to see how it affected their minds. Some believe that MJ-12 took over or continued this kind of research, pushing it even further with the help, possibly, of alien technology. Even the FBI says the whole thing is fake, and honestly, I would believe them if they weren't so full of crap. I mean, there are literal government documents located in the National Archives that mention the group pretty much by name. Nevertheless, if you Google the Majestic 12, you will be greeted with a hyperlink to the FBI's official website where they have an online statement in relation to the existence of the group. The statement reads, Majestic 12. In 1988, two FBI offices received similar versions of a memo titled Operation Majestic 12, claiming to be a highly classified government document. The memo appeared to be a briefing for newly elected President Eisenhower on a secret committee created to exploit a recovery of an extraterrestrial aircraft and cover up this work from public examination. An Air Force investigation determined the document to be fake. Um. Okay, great statement, but there's just a few problems with it. One, the page where the statement is posted on the FBI website contains PDFs of the alleged document, and a lot of information in the PDFs have been redacted. If it's fake, why bother doing that? Two, we already know of two other documents containing information about the group that undeniably exist. And three, you're telling me that the Air Force did an investigation of a ground operation and then determined that the documents were fake. I'm not buying it. And four, if it's fake, why did the FBI take the time to issue a statement and post it to their website along with heavily censored documents in the first place? I mean, protest much? There are also witnesses aside from Brazels claiming to have seen some strange things. 
So many of these witnesses stayed silent for years, but I eventually began speaking out to close friends or family about what they'd seen, still fearing repercussions from the government. There was another crash site about 40 miles from Brazel's ranch where more wreckage and alien bodies were said to be being recovered. A firefighter who went to this site claimed that he saw a large disc in the ground and several small non-human bodies nearby. He said that military officials told him to keep quiet about what he saw. Sergeant Melvin Brown also shared his experience. He said he rode in a truck with the bodies from the crash site to Roswell Field and then stood guard at the hangar where they were first kept. He was instructed not to look under a tarp, but he got curious and he peeked. He claimed he saw two alien bodies. The government has always denied his claims, but several people who were there or new people who were there have said they saw wreckage and bodies arrive at Wright Field. Retired General Arthur Exxon stated that a top secret committee was set up to oversee the investigation of this and other classified UFO incidents. After the Roswell crash, the debris was secretly flown from Fort Worth, Texas to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. At Wright Field, Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Exxon, who later became the base commander, recalled that some of the material was very thin, but incredibly strong. And it wasn't just metal that arrived at Wright Field either. At the second crash site a few miles from the first, they discovered a smaller, more intact craft and four bodies lying nearby. These bodies did not look human. Again, according to witnesses, the bodies were described as being in fairly good condition despite having been exposed for six days. Some parts of the bodies have been chewed on by animals. Descriptions from those who saw the bodies are pretty consistent. They were said to be four to five feet tall with big heads, large eyes, and small mouths. Basically your classic idea of an alien. They had thin bodies with long arms and four fingers. An army nurse who worked on the initial autopsy described how fragile the skulls and bones were too. The bodies were quickly placed in large sealed wooden crates, loaded onto a B-29 bomber and flown to Fort Worth before being sent to Wright Field. Now, the general public weren't the only ones concerned with the Roswell crash. In fact, one of the highest members of government was too, the president, which at the time was Harry S. Truman. After the incident took place, Truman became increasingly interested and concerned with UFOs, so much so that in 1948 he called a meeting with his military aide, Colonel Robert Laundrie, in the Oval Office to discuss UFO reports and what they might mean for the security of the country. Laundrie told Truman that, quote, all manner of objects and things were being seen in the sky by people as of late, which only led the president to worry more about the possibility of new, never before seen threats to the American people. And so Truman ordered a quarterly oral report from both Laundry and the Air Force to be presented to him at the White House to discuss whether or not the UFO sightings would present any kind of immediate danger. Although neither the military or the Air Force were ever able or willing to provide Truman with any answers, the UFO sightings kept coming. And and officials became more and more confused. To this day, it's unclear what information the government has gathered on UFOs, but what we do know is that if they do in fact have concrete evidence supporting the existence of alien life forms, they sure as heck aren't sharing it with us. Yet, fingers crossed. The Roswell incident was the catalyst for pretty much every modern UFO conspiracy today. Before Roswell, the idea of aliens was just that, really, an idea. But when stories about this mysterious crash hit the papers, it really changed the public's view of the possibility of alien life forever. Suddenly what people had read about in science fiction and fantasy novels or watched on the big screen was something a lot more concrete. Project Blue Book formed a few years after the Roswell incident, a genuine Air Force program dedicated to investigating UFOs, at least in the early days. Area 51, the mysterious Men in Black, Majestic 12, all of these things started being whispered about in the years following the Roswell incident. MJ-12 is said to not just be aware of, but actually involved in alien abductions. According to leaked documents about Majestic 12, they work with extraterrestrials, allowing them to abduct humans in exchange for advanced technology and knowledge. The beings they're chummy with are described as the greys, 
and this agreement supposedly lets the aliens abduct a certain number of humans for experimentation and research, I guess in like a year's worth of time, I don't know how they calculate it, but in return the aliens provide MJ-12 with advanced technology that the government uses for their top secret projects. We've all heard of accounts of alien abductions before, some poor person being dragged out of bed in the middle of the night or being sucked up by a mysterious light in the sky while driving down a desolate road only to wake up on an operating table surrounded by bald, bug-eyed weirdos sticking probes in their bodies. Majestic 12 is often thought to be responsible for covering all that up with some abductees claiming to even be monitored or threatened to keep quiet about their experiences afterwards. All right, so now that we're all caught up on what the Majestic 12 is, let's talk about who the Majestic 12 were originally, allegedly. Lloyd Veal Berkner, American physicist and engineer with various work in aeronautics, meteorology, and education. Detlev Bronk, American scientist, educator, and administrator, and the man who established biophysics as a recognized discipline. Vanner Bush, American engineer, inventor, and scientist administrator, also the head of the U.S. Office of Scientific Research and Development during World War II. James Forrestal, United States Secretary of the Navy and the first United States Secretary of Defense. Gordon Gray, American attorney and government official during the administrations of Truman and Eisenhower. Roscoe H. Hillen-Noter, first director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Jerome Clark Hunsacker, American naval officer and aeronautical engineer. David Howard Menzel, one of the first theoretical astronomers and astrophysicists in the U.S. Robert Miller Montague, Lieutenant General in the United States Army. Sidney Sowers, American military intelligence officer, director of Central Intelligence, and the head of the National Intelligence Authority. Nathan F. Twining, United States Air Force General and the Chief of Staff for the U.S. Air Force. And Hoyt Vanderberg, United States Air Force General, second Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and second director of Central Intelligence. I mean, the credentials of these 12 men are undeniable. Whether or not they were part of a secret group dedicating to discovering and researching aliens, however, is definitely debatable. But if you were to put a group of minds together for this project, these would likely be the minds that you would put together. So a lot of people think that MJ-12 uses Area 51 for some of their operations. One of the main points is that MJ-12 allegedly uses Area 51 to reverse engineer alien spacecraft. After the supposed Roswell crash in 1947, it's believed that debris and possibly even alien bodies were transported to Area 51. There, scientists and engineers, under the direction of MJ-12, would have studied and attempted to replicate this advanced technology. Then you have testing. Area 51 is well known for testing experimental aircraft, and many believe that at the very least, some of these tests involve technology recovered from aliens. Area 51 is also believed to house classified documents and evidence related to UFOs and aliens, with M12 using the base to store and protect their materials. This could include everything from alien bodies to pieces of spacecraft and reports on alien encounters. There's a theory within this theory that states that the M MJ-12 organization is a fake organization, but that it's been thought up and perpetuated by the United States government in an attempt to cover up a much bigger scandal. That the government isn't looking for aliens, but rather it is controlled by them. That's right, some people actually believe that the whole Majestic 12 conspiracy was created in order to protect the alien identities of some of our highest government officials who are actually in complete control over humanity's most elite members. But wait, there's more. Not only do these human lookalikes control the government, the media, and our bank accounts, they're also, apparently, giving us acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is a coitally transmitted virus. I'm really not sure what to make of this one. If you believe it, good for you, I guess. If you don't believe it, I, I agree with you on that one. Speaking of aliens that may be wearing human disguises to seep their way into high positions in society, Majestic 12 is also rumored to oversee experiments involving hybrid human and alien experiments. Some theorists suggest that MJ-12 has been conducting genetic experiments to create beings that combine human and alien DNA. 
The purpose of these hybrids varies depending on who you ask. Some say they're meant to help aliens blend into human society better, acting as spies. Others believe that these hybrids are part of a long term plan to slowly introduce alien genetics into the human population, either to enhance our abilities or just eradicate our species altogether. That's a fun note to end on. And we hope you've enjoyed this latest chapter in uh, alien UFO conspiracies. If we'll catch you it. are an alien, comment down below. We'll catch you next time. Cheers. list with a pretty insane news story that didn't really make the rounds over here, which is surprising because this is absolutely nuts. So last year, residents of a small isolated village in Peru claimed to have been attacked in the night by seven foot tall alien beings with glowing yellow eyes. They also had dark hoods and wore armor. They looked a bit like Green Goblin from Spider-Man. At one point, one of the beings even tried to kidnap a young woman of the village. And these attacks happened repeatedly to the point where many villagers said they were living in fear. A number of residents claimed to have fired the creatures, but they didn't go down. They could also fly. This was all over South American news. The Peruvian military was even called in to do night patrols. So what the hell was going on here? Well, the media has now come out saying that the attacks weren't aliens, but they were just illegal miners dressed as aliens trying to scare the villagers off. But how does that explain them being seemingly immune to bullets or, or flying? Carlos Castro Quatanilla, the prosecutor investigating the case, believes that the miners must have been using state-of-the-art technology that allowed them to fly. What, what does he think these illegal miners, what do they somehow have access to jetpacks? I don't know. I'm not buying that. I, I, I'm on the fence about this one. It could be illegal miners. Maybe they had bulletproof vests. But the jetpack thing, I don't, I've seen real life jetpacks uh, and they are clunky messes. They're just, first of all, no one has access to those things. And even like flying them around, it's just, it's not a, it's, it's not a smooth kind of thing. We, we don't have jetpacks, all right? Plus, I think these villagers are smart enough to know the difference between people in masks and awful jetpacks and, and, and alien beings. I don't know. A whole bunch of these villagers all said they saw this, so it's interesting. Next up, we have the Battle of Los Angeles, or the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, which took place on February 23rd of 1942, just two months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. That night, all of Los Angeles went under blackout as directed by the US military, meaning all lights were off. And while the lights on the ground had been turned off, the sky above was lit up by a myriad of strange, unidentified flying objects. The military opened fire, and onlookers were absolutely absolutely stunned as 1400 rounds of ammunition fired up into the sky appeared to have no effect on the UFO or UFOs. Smoke filled the sky and when it cleared not a single craft was to be found in the sky or on the ground. Shrapnel that appeared to have ricocheted off of the target resulted in the death of five civilians. Three more were killed in car accidents due to the chaos of the event and two more of heart attacks due to the stress of the two hour long attack. To this day it is unknown what objects filled the sky of Los Angeles that night. The event went down in history as one of the largest UFO sightings to date. We really don't know what happened, but if you have any theories, feel free to let us know in the comments. Next on the list, we have the Shag Harbor incident. At 11.20 p.m. on October 4th, 1967, multiple witnesses in Nova Scotia watched as a mysterious object crashed into the waters of Shag Harbor. But let's backtrack a little and go over some of the other sightings from that night leading up to this. It all began with Air Canada Flight 305, where First Officer Robert Ralph alerted Captain Pierre Charbonneau to a strange object outside the aircraft over Sherbrooke in St. John, Quebec. It was described as a brightly lit rectangular object 
with smaller lights trailing it. Meanwhile, Daryl Dory and his family in Mahone Bay saw a large object in the sky. Captain Leo Howard Mercy, a fisherman, witnessed stationary blips on his radar. He, along with his crew, then looked up to see four bright objects in a rectangular formation in the sky. News stations were also being flooded with numerous other people reporting glowing objects over Halifax. And then we have the crash. A ton of residents reported hearing a whoosh, followed by a loud bang, and at least 11 people reported seeing a low flying object crash into the water of Shag Harbor. I'm sure you hear a lot of banging sounds around Shag Harbor. Terrible joke. Witnesses watched as an object with glowing lights floated in the water. It was just kind of like floating there. The RCMP was then called in who then contacted the Rescue Coordination Center, but before they could arrive, the object started to sink into the water. The Coast Guard was called in, as well as the military. No debris or survivors were found, and according to the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, all commercial, private, and military aircraft, they were all accounted for along the eastern seaboard. Whatever this object was, it's never been identified, and it has been officially designated as an unidentified flying object. Alyoshenka, also known as the Kishtim creature, was the remains of a small humanoid discovered in May of 1996 by an elderly woman named Tamara Vasi Levyenya Prosvi Arena in Russia. What she found was a small grayish fetus about 25 centimeters long, but it didn't look human. It had large bulging eyes. Its skull had odd ridges. It looked very alien. And to me, it almost looks like it has a bit of a beak too. Naturally, the news of this strange find spread like wildfire. Even Japanese TV networks came over to make documentaries about it. But then things took a darker turn. Prosperina ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Shortly after, the remains mysteriously disappeared after being handed over to the authorities for DNA testing. Prosperina's family never got it back, and tragically, she died in a car accident. Now, the official explanation was that Alyoshenka was just a severely deformed human fetus, but some don't buy that to this day, saying that the differences in the skull and other odd features about it, 20 in total, were just too odd to be explained away as a deformed human. Some say there's a very good chance that Russian scientists got their hands on a genuine alien corpse. The Pascagoula abduction. In 1973, two guys, Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker, were fishing on the Pascagoula River in Mississippi when they claimed they had an alien encounter. And no, I'm not just talking about lights in the sky. According to them, these weird robotic looking creatures with claw-like hands came out of a UFO, paralyzed them, and then took them aboard their craft. Once they were inside, Hickson and Parker said they were subjected to some sort of examination by these beings before finally being released back to their fishing spot. The two men went straight to the local sheriff's office to report what happened. The story blew up in the media, and while a lot of people were skeptical, others were genuinely curious and shaken up about the story. The thing is, Hickson and Parker stuck to their story for years. Parker, who was just 19 at the time, even stayed out of the spotlight for decades because of how traumatized he was by the whole thing. But years later, he finally started speaking out again, and his story never changed. Now we head back to Russia with the Voronezh UFO incident of 1989. According to reports in the city of Voronezh on September 27, 1989, a UFO supposedly landed in the park. Witnesses claimed that a three-eyed humanoid creature and a robot-like figure emerged from the craft. The aliens were described as having large heads and strange shaped feet. The young witnesses said they watched as one of these alien creatures used a ray gun to make a teenager disappear before they climbed back into the craft and disappeared. It is a ridiculous story, but it made headlines across the Soviet Union, and the military was even involved in investigating the site. On top of that, a police officer claimed to have seen a body flying in the sky on the day of the incident. So, did the Voronezh incident really happen? Well, there's no hard proof, but the details and just the sheer number of people who claimed to have witnessed the incident definitely makes it an intriguing case at the very least. The Atacama Skeleton, or Eta as it's often called. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh, they found out it was just a human with deformities. Well, 
Maybe not. For those that don't know, back in 2003, this tiny mummified skeleton was discovered in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And when I say tiny, I mean like really small. This thing was only about six inches long, and on top of the small size was its appearance. It had this elongated skull and a strange rib structure. It only had 10 ribs instead of the usual 12. When the story hit the news, people were instantly like, is this an alien? And for years, some folks were convinced that it was. The whole idea that scientists might have finally caught an actual alien creature was super exciting. I mean, I remember this story hitting the news when I was little. In 2018, though, researchers from Stanford University decided to dig deeper into what Atta actually was. They did some DNA analysis and found out that it was human, specifically a fetus with several severe genetic mutations. But even then, this has been debated, and the theory that it could be an extraterrestrial or some other unknown form of life is still talked about to this day. The Lovett Cunningham Incident In March of 1956, Air Force Sergeant Jonathan P. Lovett and Major William Cunningham were out in the New Mexico desert near Holloman Air Force Base. They were searching for debris from a rocket test, but what they ended up finding was worse than anything they could have possibly imagined. According to a report detailing the incident from an investigation by the Air Force, Cunningham heard a scream and rushed over, expecting to find Lovett in some sort of trouble, maybe being bitten by a snake, but instead, what he saw was Lovett being pulled by a long serpentine arm from a hovering silver disc. The disc, which hovered about 15 to 20 feet above the ground, seemed to drag Lovett into the crap before it shot up into the sky. And Cunningham stumbled back to his Jeep and called for help. Security teams arrived and Cunningham was taken to the base hospital, clearly shaken by what he'd seen. And meanwhile, search parties were dispatched to find Lovett. It wasn't until three days later, though, that Lovett's body was discovered about 10 miles from where he'd gone missing. His body was nude and it was severely mutilated. There was a lot of stuff missing. The autopsy results couldn't even clarify what exactly had happened to him. The details of this report were shared by two men, one named William Cooper, who claimed to have been tasked with analyzing the report in the early 70s, and a former Green Beret captain named William English, who also claimed to have seen the same report. Till this day, though, the government denies its existence. Next on our list today, we have the North Yorkshire, England event, which took place in 1952. Reports of a bright silver disc-shaped object the size of a large bus hovering in the sky began spreading across the country. The aircraft was witnessed by people from many different towns, as well as Royal Air Force pilots. In the days that followed, more similar objects were spotted in the skies above the county. People described the aircrafts as being even larger than the one in the first sighting, and described their maneuvers as being impossible for any known aircraft at the time. The events went on for many days and had hundreds of witnesses. Some even used radar technology to track the unknown craft, but no one was able to figure out its origin. Speculation of the UFO being an alien spaceship quickly took off, with others believing that the spherical ships belonged to the government and that they had been deployed into the sky for some kind of super secret military operation. Well, here's the thing. The event took place over 70 years ago, and the government has yet to fess up to the ships being there which at this point you'd think they would have done, right? I mean, to be fair, if they did fess up by now, I probably still wouldn't believe them, but I want to know what you guys think. Alien spacecraft or yet another government cover-up story? Next up is the Cash Landrum incident. On the evening of December 29th, 1980, Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Vicki's grandson, Colby Landrum, were driving home to Dayton, Texas after dining out when they encountered a mysterious diamond-shaped object emitting flames and intense heat. It was floating above the trees. At first, Landrum, thinking it was a sign of the second coming, told Cash to stop the car. Cash considered turning back, but the road was too narrow. The object was described as intensely bright with small blue lights descending toward the road, emitting flames periodically. Cash and Landrum had gotten out of the car to look at the object, but got back in when the heat became more and more intense. It got so bad that it burned Cash's hand when she 
touched the car. Landrum even left a handprint on the dashboard. Then the object started ascending again, and after it was back up in the air, a group of military helicopters surrounded it. So after making it back home that night, the three started feeling off, reporting symptoms like nausea and skin burns after the encounter, with Cash experiencing severe health issues, including large blisters and clumps of her hair falling out. Vicky developed a cataract and Betty was diagnosed with cancer later on. Symptoms resembling radiation exposure, really looks like. The two went on to seek legal action, suing the US government for $20 million, but the case ended up being dismissed. All right, next on our list, we have the Gorman incident. In October of 1948, Second Lieutenant George F. Gorman was flying a P-15 Mustang aircraft during a training flight. Everything seemed to be going pretty routine until he noticed a strange object in the sky. At first, he assumed it to be some type of weather balloon or other kind of experimental aircraft, but as he flew closer to the object to get a better observation, he realized it was something entirely different. He described it as some kind of pulsating, glowing ball of light. He tried to fly away from it, but to his surprise, the object began to follow him. Gorman tried to outmaneuver the unidentifiable flying object, but he was unsuccessful. He claimed that it appeared as though the UFO could anticipate his moves before they even happened. After a while, Gorman began to get seriously freaked out, and in a final attempt to lose this strange glowing ball, he decided the best plan of action was a nosedive. He dove the plane directly towards the ground and after a 27 minute chase, he was able to lose the object. He leveled out his plane and lived to tell the tale. But no one, including Gorman, knows exactly what was seen in the sky that day. But what's even crazier is that after the incident, his plane tested positive for radioactivity. No one knows why, that's so wild. Next on the list is the Alderney UFO sighting. On April 23, 2007, pilot Ray Boyer and his passengers observed a strange light while flying near Alderney. At first he thought it was reflected light, but soon realized that it was an object, estimating its size to be about a mile wide. He described it as bright yellow gold with black bands on the side. He also spotted a second object, similar but further away. Boyer reported the sighting to authorities, labeling it a near miss. Now, Despite his report, the British Ministry of Defense didn't carry out an investigation, stating it occurred in French airspace. Witnesses on Boyer's aircraft and another pilot from Blue Islands confirmed seeing similar objects. One described it as sunlight colored and another as an elongated oval. Next up, we have a UFO sighting at the O'Hare International Airport in Chicago. The incident took place at 4.15 p.m. on November 7th of 2006, so it's actually pretty recent. 12 different airport employees reported seeing a large saucer-shaped unidentified flying object hovering over one of the airport gates, gate C-17 to be exact. And it was actually hovering above another aircraft that had been set to depart O'Hare but was delayed because, well, because there was a giant flying saucer hovering above it. Duh. The pilots in the plane, along with mechanics on the ground and airline management reported to have seen the object. But air traffic controllers, however, did not see it because for some reason the craft above the plane was not picked up on their radars. The UFO was visible for several minutes before it suddenly disappeared. And even though the incident had many credible witnesses and was later investigated by the Federal Aviation Administration, no explanation was ever given regarding the events of the day. All right, the Travis Walton case. So this story has it all. A UFO sighting corroborated by multiple witnesses and a supposed encounter with alien beings. So it was November 5th, 1975. Travis Walton and his fellow loggers had finished up their day in the Apache Site Greaves National Forest in Arizona. They loaded onto their truck and began the drive back home. They hadn't gotten far though when they noticed odd lights hovering above some trees. They decided to drive closer to see what was going on and that's when they saw a massive unidentified object. Travis got out of the truck to see what the thing was and then was suddenly lifted into the air by a beam of light. The rest of his friends drove out of there in a panic but knew they couldn't leave him there. By the time they returned to the scene though, Travis was gone. 
and he would be missing for days. Five days after disappearing, Travis Walton showed up again though. He placed a call to his sister's place from a phone booth outside of town. He was found disoriented and disturbed and began telling this horrifying story about how he'd woken up in a hospital-like room where two bald, alien-like entities were looking down at him. He tried to fight the creatures off, before a human being wearing a helmet led him to another room where three other humans put a plastic mask over his face. He then lost consciousness again before waking up by the side of the highway. And to finish off our list today, we have the possible involvement of a UFO in the disappearance of an F-89C Scorpion jet fighter. The aircraft had been used in a training mission over Lake Superior in Michigan in 1953. It had left from the Kinchiol Air Force Base, I apologize if I'm saying that wrong, with two incredibly experienced pilots at its controls. As it tends to, everything was going smoothly until it wasn't. All of a sudden, the plane had disappeared from the tracking radars on the ground, and it was replaced by something else. An object that was moving around erratically and rapidly. Ground operators were unable to identify what it might be, but knew that it couldn't possibly be the missing aircraft due to its movements. Eventually, that object also vanished from the radar. An investigation was conducted on the disappearance of the jet fighter, as well as the pilots on board, as well as the origin of the second radar detection. But it should come as a shock to none of you that the investigation revealed absolutely nothing. But officials did say that based on the pilot's level of expertise and the relatively easy nature of the flight, it's highly unlikely that their disappearance was an accident. But what do you guys think? In August and September of 1951, residents of Lubbock, Texas started reporting a series of weird lights in a V-type formation flying through the night sky. The sightings were consistent and happened over several nights. The first sightings were reported by professors from Texas Technological College on August 25th. They'd been sitting in a friend's backyard when they spotted 20 to 30 lights flying overhead. They described the lights as bright and incredibly fast, moving in a way that didn't match any known air craft or natural phenomenon. They even took some photos which have become pretty famous in UFO circles. The Lubbock Lights case caught the attention of the US Air Force, which was running Project Blue Book at the time, and their official statement was that the lights were probably just plover birds reflecting the city's new lights, which had been installed that same year, but some people weren't buying it, like the head of Texas Tech's biology department. Looking at these two sketches, you'd have to assume the artists were drawing the same thing, right? Well, what if I told you that these were drawn by two boys at two separate times who had absolutely nothing to do with each other? That would be kind of strange, wouldn't it? Seeing as whatever this creature they're depicting is, it doesn't look like any known animal. In April of 1977 in Dover, Massachusetts, several witnesses described spotting a creature just like the one drawn in those pictures. The creature was described as having an odd, almost alien appearance with large glowing eyes, a hairless body, and long, thin limbs. Three teenagers reported seeing this strange being while driving through the area who was climbing a concrete wall. One of them managed to sketch a drawing of what they saw for the police. About an hour later, another pair of boys spotted the thing, which ran into a gully and stood still next to a tree. They also drew a sketch for police. So this thing was spotted by multiple people over a short period of time. The reports came from different locations, but were consistent in their descriptions. Local police investigated, but no physical evidence was ever found, at least not that we know of. Popocate Paddle Volcano in Mexico. Mexico is just full of UFO and alien sightings in general. It turns out Mexico is in seventh place for the most UFO sightings in the entire world. There were a bunch of alien fossils brought forth to Mexican Congress a while back, if you remember that, that made headlines. But this volcano is just a hotbed, pun very much intended. I could probably fill up an entire list with UFO settings spotted in this one area alone. It's not only one of the most active volcanoes in the country, but it also seems to be one of the most active sites for unidentified flying objects. UFO sightings around Popocate Petal have led to a lot of curiosity among locals and researchers. Witnesses described seeing these strange unidentified flying objects near the volcano, flying in weird, unpredictable patterns. The volcano sits in an area famous for seismic and volcanic activity, so some think that these conditions might be 
attracting extraterrestrials for whatever reason. The Flatwoods Encounter On the night of September 12, 1952, in the small town of Flatwoods, West Virginia, a group of six youngsters were out playing a casual game of football when suddenly the sky lit up with a bright fireball that looked like it was plummeting straight toward the earth. Together with a woman named Kathleen May, they headed toward the hillside where they thought the object had landed. And just as they reached the hill, there was a bright flash of light. When they turned to look, they saw something they would never forget. It was this massive thing, standing around 12 feet tall. It had a red face, bright green clothing, and a head shaped like the ace of spades. It was just hovering there in midair, moving toward them. The group ran back to town in a panic and relayed their story to authorities. The Flatwoods monster was never seen again, but everyone who was there that night swore they saw it. And lastly, we have the Roswell alien. In 1947, something crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. At first, the military said they'd found a flying disc, which of course was on the front page of every newspaper. But then almost overnight, the story changed and they said it was just a weather balloon. Now, was that all there was to it? Just a misidentified weather balloon? Well, too many odd stories have come out over the years to just chalk it up to that without looking into it any further. There weren't just witnesses, there were military personnel and scientists who claimed to have been called to the scene and were sworn to secrecy. But some of them just couldn't keep their mouths shut and let things slip over the years. Some claimed that not only did they see the crash, but they also saw the remains of strange, small, humanoid creatures. Aliens, if you will. And supposedly the military scooped up the wreckage and the bodies and whisked them away to a secret location, likely Area 51, which wasn't even publicly known about at the time. The big conspiracy is that the government covered up the whole thing, hiding the evidence of extraterrestrial life. Coming into number 10, we have up close and personal.
too. Apparently, even actor James Dean saw these lights while filming the movie Giant. But no one knows what they really are. But of course, they're rumored to be UFOs, ghosts, or even fairies. Coming in at number six, we have Stonehenge. Located in Wiltshire, England, the Stonehenge is one of the UK's most famous landmarks. It consists of a bunch of standing stones in a ring, with some stones placed on top of each other. In fact, it's considered the UK's most mysterious site. First off, we don't know how people managed to build these huge structures like 5,000 plus years ago when they didn't have any construction machinery. Like the stones themselves weigh around 25 tons. There's no way they were just lugging those around themselves. Theory goes that they were somehow dragging the rocks though by having them lubricated in pig fat. Again, we still don't know. Not only that, but we don't know why they were built in the first place. Many scholars agree that Stonehenge was once a burial ground. Others believe it might have been a place of worship. But again, we don't know. And count how many times I said that in this video. Coming into number five, we have the Roswell Rescue. Footage claiming to be from Vacation. Coming into number three, we have another alien, of course. In 2012, Chicago.
incident and how it occurred honestly and truthfully. Here are the previously classified images of the crash. Now, as you can see, vehicles raced to recover the wreckage, which was extremely sensitive to the United States Air Force. It seems a government sanitation team was deployed to remove all traces of the spy plane. To me, that sounds very, very strange. So, too, does it that they kept the images of this plane crash a secret for such a long time? Do you think it really was a spy plane that crashed, or given the response, something much more sensitive? We are now at our fifth and halfway mark. jars slash how did they make that many and two what were they used for a recent theory suggests that the jars were used for the dead basically a dead body was placed in there to then be exposed to the elements then when only their bones were left they would take them and bury them but again we still don't know for sure and in our number one spot today we have roswell new mexico of course, this place is associated with UFOs and aliens. Apparently in 1947, a UFO crashed there. A ranch worker claimed he found debris from the crash. Later, it was collected by the military and they were like, oh yeah, that, that's just, that's just part of a weather balloon. Lies, no one believed that. We all know they were covering up the fact that it was part of a UFO. Since then, hundreds of UFO sightings have been accounted for in the area. It seems like Roswell is the hotspot for extraterrestrial activity. All right, guys, that's all for today's video. Let me know in the comments below which one of these places you thought was the most mysterious. And now, speaking of comments, let's move on to our comment shout out portion. I'll be shouting out comments from the video Top 10 Scary Inventions in History That Should Be Forgotten, Part 5. Alana Richardson commented, I've been watching Peach. It's amazing. Can I get a shout out? Yes, you can. Everyone that has been subscribed to my new channel, Peach, 
can get a shout out. So uh, if you are subscribed, wait, first off, if you haven't gone and subscribed to Peach, go over there, hit subscribe, come back, and then comment uh, Peach emojis. And uh, maybe I'll shout out your comment. CLC in Florida commented, really? <laughs> Human torches at garden parties? That is such BS. Have you ever smelled burning flesh and hair? Nobody could eat under those circumstances. I agree, it's just disgusting. Plus they'd be like screaming while they're burning, so. Uh, would not be pleasant. Let's just say that, would not. Kalia Marzet commented, tanning beds, final destination. I am so glad that someone commented this because that scene scarred me for life. Every time I think of tanning beds, I think of that one scene from Final Destination. No thank you. No. Just never. Alright guys, that's all the comments I'm shouting out for today's video. Make sure to comment something down below for a chance to be featured in my next comment shout out. And as always, don't forget to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to the most amazing top 10 for more amazing videos. I've been your host, Lindsay Ivan, and I'll see ya when I see ya. Want to see more videos like this one? Check out this video next. It's about urban legends and the research we conducted personally on it. We found out something interesting that will be sure to scare you guys. Click the video now to find out more. See you in the next video.